Birds are weird. They are what happens when you force a dinosaur to fly after all. As a consequence of evolving to fly in a completely different way to the skin and muscle flying pterosaurs, the skeleton of the avian dinosaur has been altered in bizarre and often disgusting ways. One of those ways are little itty bitty spikes that protrude from their ribs. What are they? Why are they there? And how far back in their family tree do they go? A brand new study tried to tackle these questions and more and found something more far reaching than initially intended. With the exception of the Australian incubator birds, mound builders or megapodes, and the South American screamers of the anime suborder, pretty much almost all living birds have hook-like bony bone prongs sticking out flag-like from the back of several pairs of ribs in the shoulder area, or what is anatomically referred to as the thorax or thoracic region. Plenty of researchers, amateurs, teachers, and their students have been trying to figure out what these structures, which have been called uncinate processes, might be for, for hundreds of years. It's one of those mysteries that has a few possible answers, so it's not really much of a mystery, but just hasn't been proven without a shadow of a doubt as to which possible use they had. The most common ideas are that they help strengthen the ribcage and improve airflow. Things usually have more than one use, right? Almost 20 years ago, Jonathan Codd, Phil Manning, Mark Norell, and Stephen Perry conducted a lengthy study on the Canada Goose that gave important experimental support to the ventilatory hypothesis. As such, their research suggested that the uncinate processes of birds might work like levers and help the trunk muscles pump air into and out of the body. Crocodilians and archosaur are the closest living relatives to birds and therefore also have uncinate processes. However, instead of hard bone hooks, crocodilian uncinate processes look like soft cartilaginous tabs. It's unknown how the uncinate processes of crocodilians might work or if they have the same evolutionary roots as the uncinate processes of birds. Perhaps they evolved completely independently to the similar structures in birds. Many extinct members of the dinosaur group Panoraptora, which includes birds and their close dinosaur relatives, the Ovaraptorosaurs, the Scansoriopterygids, Archaeopterygids, Dromaeosaurs, and more, as well as the one and only primitive Italian Ornithomimosaur Pelicanemimus, which is related to birds but not as closely as those critters in the Panoraptora, have bone structures that are similar to those of modern birds. All of these dinosaurs, including birds, belong to a group called Theropoda. The majority of these dinosaurs walked on two legs and consumed meat. Dinosauria, as it is currently known, is split into the Saurischia, which are the theropods and sauropods, and the Ornithischia, which are the Thyreophorans, Marginocephalians, and Ornithopods. There are a few members of the pretty much exclusively herbivorous group Ornithischia that have tabs on their ribs. The common name for these structures is intercostal plates, but because they resemble the uncinate processes of crocodiles so closely, PhD candidate Yanyan Wang of the University of Alberta suspects that they are in fact uncinate processes. They might include some bone, but more than likely the majority of them are formed of cartilage that has hardened over the course of the animal's lives. Calcification is the term for this process. Araripesuchus, a small terrestrial cretaceous cousin of crocodiles, 
has spike-like uncinate processes that were likely also formed of calcified cartilage. If you take all the evidence at face value, it demonstrates that Ararypesuchus, some Ornithischians, and a relatively small group of theropods, including birds, developed their own bony or calcified uncinate processes, whereas only crocodilians have soft cartilaginous uncinate processes. On the other hand, the process of evolution and the persistence of fossils both hint to a different possibility. Due to the pliability and fragility of normal cartilage that hasn't yet hardened into bone, it nearly never survives long enough to turn into a fossil. It's possible that dinosaurs had cartilaginous uncinate processes similar to those present in modern crocodiles, but no fossils of dinosaurs with these features have ever been discovered. Another possibility is that uncinate processes are a common and inherited trait among all members of the archosaur group, that being pterosaurs, dinosaurs, their bird descendants, and crocodiles. In other words, crocodilians, Ararypesuchus, ornithischians, and theropods may have all inherited their uncinate processes from the archosaur's common ancestor. As a result, the soft cartilage may have been transformed into bone, or it may have become more rigid. If this scenario were to play out, our current understanding of the anatomy of extinct archosaurs would need to be revised to account for the addition of uncinate processes to their rib cages. It would also imply that we need to revise our ideas on the development of uncinate processes. But how could you possibly verify this? Well, that's what a team of researchers headed by Yan Ying Wang that also included Leon, Claysons, and Corwin Sullivan set out to find. Their work was just published in Communications Biology. All the way back in 2016, Yan Ying Wang and Corwin Sullivan were on a research trip in Johannesburg at the Evolutionary Studies Institute at the University of Witwatersrand. At that time, they were just starting to learn about uncinate processes and the idea that they might have been common in long-dead archosaurs. They took some ribs from a modern Nile crocodile out of a drawer in the Institute's great collection of anatomical specimens. On the edges of those ribs, where cartilaginous uncinate processes had once been attached, they noticed what they'd been looking for, clear facets that they soon came to call uncinate scars. If the pair found similar scars on the ribs of extinct archosaurs, they could infer the presence of uncinate processes, even if they couldn't find the actual processes on the rib fossils themselves. On the team's last night in South Africa, they happened to go to a game restaurant with some co-workers. There, they saw an unexpected result of that exciting discovery. Crocodile ribs were on the menu, along with other tasty things like impala and kudu meat. Corwin took one and scraped enough of the good stuff off so that they could see for the first time how a crocodile's uncinate processes worked. First time for this team, at least. When they got back to the Institute of Vertebrate Paleontology and Paleoanthropology in Beijing, where the two colleagues were both working at the time, they decided to do more formal crocodile dissections. As Yan Ying Wang states, he also learned that uncinate scars don't just happen in crocodiles, but also in young birds whose bony uncinate processes are still attached to their ribs by soft tissues. Adult birds usually have their uncinate processes fused to their ribs, so they can't be taken off without breaking the ribs. Wang's search for uncinate scars took him on several research travels to significant fossil collections in the United States, Canada, and China. Wang was fortunate enough to locate a specimen of an incomplete crocodile rib with an uncinate scar at the American Museum of Natural History in New York. This scar was virtually identical to the ones observed on living crocodiles in South Africa. This made the team feel better since it provided evidence that their assumptions that the presence of uncinate processes could be inferred from the presence of uncinate scars was in fact correct. At the Canadian Museum of Nature in Ottawa, there was a skeleton of the Tyrannosaurus Despliosaurus terosus situated at the exact center of the dinosaur gallery. As Wang inspected the skeletal mount, he clearly noted the same uncinate scars he and his colleagues had been seeing in other fossils. Despite the fact this skeletal mount had been standing in the museum since the 70s, it took a few people looking at an awfully specific feature and comparing and contrasting it to other features to realize them for what they are, or were. If they are present in Daspletosaurus, then they are definitely going to be present in Tyrannosaurus. 
When Wang had completed his tour of the collections, he discovered 66 unique uncinate scars on at least 19 distinct fossil archosaur species. Unfortunately, many of these scars were attached to such fragmentary specimens that they could not be identified down to a species level, so they were left with genus or even more generic labels. In addition to these scars, Wang had also been able to identify 19 full uncinate processes preserved in various specimens. They were definitely composed of straight-up bone or at least hard calcified cartilage. All of this puts forth a lot of hard evidence for the hypothesis that uncinate processes are common among the entire archosaur tree and are a shared characteristic that some lost along the evolutionary way. Wang and his colleagues found these processes in some extinct dinosaurs, some extinct birds, modern birds, modern crocodiles, and three extinct groups of crocodilians. This is quite robust, but when exactly did these interesting rib features originate in the annals of dino history? In order to make better sense of the data the two collected, Corwin Sullivan and Yan Yin Wang then collaborated with an old colleague of Sullivan's and an authority on the development of archosaur breathing in order to make sense of their findings, Leon Clayson's. The whole team, now assembled, conducted a few tests. One of these tests required a mathematical formula using R, a language and environment for statistical computation, to conduct a test called an ancestral state reconstruction. The purpose of this was to determine whether or not uncinate processes were likely to have been an ancestral trait of just dinosaurs or archosaurs as a whole. This form of analysis, which can be carried out using a variety of techniques and points of departure, examines the way in which a trait is distributed along a phylogenetic tree, in order to determine how it could have adapted over the course of evolution. The team examined their data on the distribution of uncinate processes using this technique, and while doing so, they experimented with a variety of algorithms and presumptions to determine how the changes impacted the findings. The findings of the study provided compelling evidence that both Dinosauria and Archosauria descended from animals that possessed cartilaginous uncinate processes. Such results are always based on probabilities and are subject to change as new information becomes available. However, the evidence so far suggests that soft cartilaginous uncinate processes were common in Archosauria and were inherited from the ancestors of Archosaurs. These uncinate processes evolved into bony or calcified ones in a relatively small number of instances when it was determined that increased strength and stiffness would be beneficial. This could also explain why there is a difference among modern crocodiles as to who does or doesn't have these structures. Some needed extra support and others did not. The archosaur tree is divided in two, the Ave Metatarsalia and the Pseudosuchia. Ave Metatarsalia contains the pterosaurs, the dinosaurs, and their bird descendants, anything more closely related to birds than to crocodiles. The Pseudosuchia, on the other hand, contains all crocodilians and anything more closely related to them than to birds. That includes a huge number of now extinct groups, plenty of which looked very croc-like but were not, in fact, crocodiles. An interesting thing to note about this new study by Wang and friends is that only four taxa that are positioned outside of the crocodile part of the Pseudosuchia part of the archosaur tree were included. The team only found uncinate processes in four species that happen to be well outside of the usual advanced archosaurs. This technically means that it is less likely that cartilaginous uncinate processes were present in the ancestors of the Archosauria group proper. However, it's much more likely that these structures were present in the ancestors of the Dinosauria proper. This is just technical science sidestepping here. They find that the processes are likely to have originated with the common ancestors of the Archosauria as a whole, but were able to prove this much more strongly with Dinosauria than the Pseudosuchia. As a supplementary test to determine whether or not uncinate processes were plesiomorphic or broadly ancestral in archosaurs, further research should incorporate vertebral ribs from other fossilized pseudosuchians. It is not that they lacked them, it is that the authors of this study only found four, didn't make their research any less productive. 
The scars for these uncinate prongs found in various fossil archosaurs combined with relatively few known examples of preserved uncinate processes themselves provides a stronger base for the inference that uncinate processes were quite widespread and ancestral in the dinosauria group. It turns out that the uncinate processes are ancestral to all of archosauria and it turns out that the correlation between uncinate processes and their scars hold true for groups outside of birds and crocs, then it seems most likely that these uncinate processes were tab-shaped originally and remained tab-shaped in the Pseudosuchia group and the non-theropod dinosaurs. It would mean that they became more spinier, harder, and prong-shaped in the dinosaur lineages that led to birds. Phytosaurs, the crocodile-shaped non-crocodile archosaurs from the Triassic period, were included in this study. The authors of this study treated them as members of that huge Pseudosuchia grouping, but if it turns out that, instead, they belong outside of Archosauria proper, as some researchers have hypothesized, then the presence of the uncinate processes in this group makes the entire structure older and more ancestral to these reptiles. But the wider distribution of these structures across the sauropsid or reptile group needs to be further investigated before jumping the gun. Wacky stuff for sure. Though this discovery answers some questions, it still leaves some behind. Like why did Archosaurs' ancestors even need uncinate processes to begin with? But before I change the topic to this question, let me just run through all the animals they found uncinate scars, uncinate process, or both in, because I like lists. Who doesn't like lists? Albertosaurus, Allosaurus, Despletosaurus, Gorgosaurus, Sornitholestes, Struthiomimus, Griposaurus, Bactrosaurus, Tenontosaurus, Centrosaurus, Pachyrhinosaurus, Leptoceratops, Parxosaurus, Zephyrosaurus, Panoplosaurus, Edmontonia, Sorpelta, Euoplocephalus, Stegosaurus, Apatosaurus, an Atosaur, and two indeterminate Phytosaurs. It's possible that the uncinate processes used by early archosaurs helped them breathe, similar to how they assist birds breathe now. In 2019, Jonathan Codd once again led a research team on the American alligator, which resulted in the discovery of intriguing evidence that suggests that this may have been the case. Crocodiles' uncinate processes are located mostly in a muscle in their backs known as the iliocostalis. Cod and his team demonstrated that this muscle is active while the animal is exhaling, and they attributed this activity to it. They claimed that when an animal takes a deep breath, the contraction of the iliocostalis muscle needs to force the ribs to shift inwards and rearward, which helps push air out of the lungs. This occurs when the alligator takes a deep breath. Assuming that the uncinate processes aid the iliocostalis to rotate the ribs, which appears to be the case, this research demonstrates that the uncinate processes perform more than only assisting birds in breathing. They could have been of assistance to the ancient archosaur common ancestor as well. If the uncinate processes that archosaur ancestors used to assist them in breathing were indeed helpful, then these processes would have been a basic archosaur adaptation for improved breathing that modern crocodiles and birds subsequently adapted for more uses. Uncinating mechanisms are an integral component of the intricate respiratory system that enables birds in particular to fulfill the requirements of powered flight. This was not the purpose for which they were originally developed, but it happened to be one of the many keys in the toolbox of the dinosaurs that allowed them to take to the skies. For more interesting stories about nature, the history of life, or what goes bump in the night, subscribe, hit the bell icon for updates, like this video, and drop a comment in the comment section below. Thanks for watching. Special thanks to my elephant tier patrons Arda Bayer, Biotiverse, Christoph Hubbinger, Dinosaur, Isaiah Garza, PA Brew News, Ray, Rudy Redgrave, Smiling Walrus. And another thanks to my Tyrannosaurus tier patrons Iberospinus, Iron Bladesman, Swaffles is Weird, Teeny Dragator, The Dogman.